Hello, this is English 103. My name is Daniel Lambert, and I would like to talk with you today about the differences between utopian and dystopian literature. We will be reading uh, George Orwell's novel Animal Farm this semester, so I consider Animal Farm to be an example of dystopian literature. And you may have actually read a dystopian novel or story without realizing it. So think about some of the stories on this list. Um, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, The Hunger Games, The Man in the High Castle, The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, these are all dystopian stories. So the question is, what is a dystopian story or novel? And something can be considered dystopian if it fits this definition. Uh, but let's talk first about the opposite of a dystopia, which is a utopia. And according to Sir Thomas More in his book, Utopia, a utopia is an ideal place or state. So Sir Thomas More described an island, which he called Utopia. And uh, because of that, he um, really coined the term Utopia for an almost perfect place or state. Now we get to dystopia, which has a lot more conflict and yet is a lot more interesting for the writer and often for the reader because of the, the conflict that arises. Um, for instance, in the novel Fahrenheit 451, I think Ray Bradbury describes a dystopia and dictionary.com defines the term dystopia as a society in which everything is as bad as it can be. Now in Animal Farm, Everything is not as bad as it can be, but it is certainly, um, you know, under the dictatorship of this uh, pig called Napoleon, who really represents uh, Joseph Stalin, the, the former Soviet leader. So Animal Farm, as I said, is a dystopian novel, and it's a fairly short novel, you know, a little bit more than uh, 100 pages, depending on the edition that you have. Um, but, you know, as we will see in this class, um, this is also an allegory, and so there are many incidents in the history of Russia and the Soviet Union that match up with incidents and characters in Animal Farm. But let's talk about what a novel is. There are various forms of fiction. There is flash fiction, which I like to write, which is usually under 1,000 words. There is the short story, which is 1,000 words to about 50 pages. The novella is roughly 51 to 100 pages, and a novel is almost always more than 100 pages. And another question is, you know, is Orwell's Animal Farm science fiction or fantasy? Well, these are genres that are very, you know, closely related. Um, and if we look at what Orwell says about his novel, he calls it a fairy story. So a fairy tale is really more of a fantasy story. But if we you know, look at some other dystopian stories, most dystopias tend to be science fiction. So um, a utopian future you know, might be represented by the TV show Star Trek, where there are problems, but a lot of the problems we have in today's society, uh, like pollution and overcrowding, have been solved. There are, you know, like I said, plenty of dystopian stories like Blade Runner, which originally was a story called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. Um, there's Fahrenheit 451 by Mr. Bradbury. And of course, um, Animal Farm can be classified as a dystopia. There is Space Opera, which is uh, something like Star Wars, which really is a, a mix of fantasy and science fiction elements. There is cyberpunk as represented by the matrix where you usually have people that are cybernetically enhanced, um, you know, whether physically or mentally. And there is also, you know, the punk aspect, which means they're rebelling against a big corporation or rebelling against the government. And usually you have some kind of an anti-hero ra rather than a um, standard hero. And then steampunk is very unusual. Steampunk is a relatively recent subgenre of science fiction in which you know we imagine technology in the days of Queen Victoria and Abraham Lincoln. There is actually a uh, popular comic book series by Mike Magnolia uh, called The Incredible Screw-On-Head, which is about a robot that um, 
or who works for Abraham Lincoln. And 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea could also be considered a steampunk novel, although Jules Verne probably you know, uh, never thought of it that way. So if we talk about the structure of Animal Farm, most novels follow a three-act structure, meaning that they have a beginning, middle, and an end. And novels are usually you know, divided into chapters or parts. So we have 10 chapters in Animal Farm. And if some of you have read chapter one already, you know that this starts with Old Major speech. Old Major is a representation of Karl Marx, you know, giving the ideas of animalism in the story, which represents communism. Uh, chapter two is about the overthrow of the farm, really, you know, representing the um, the takeover of Russia um, during the Russian Revolution in 1917 by the working class under Lenin. We have the Seven Commandments of Animal Farm. Probably the most famous uh, of the commandments is all animals are equal, and that gets changed later in the novel. We have the, the rift or the conflict in Chapter 3 between Napoleon, remember, who represents Stalin, and Snowball. And uh, Snowball represents a real person, Leon Trotsky, who was exiled from the Soviet Union. And even though he played a large role in the revolution, the Soviet leadership erased him from the history books. It was as if he never existed. And then for chapters four through 10, well, you guys will just have to read those chapters to find out what happens. I'm not giving away the ending. And as far as characters, we have several characters, uh, but we can really classify the characters as either animal characters or human characters. The human characters you know, tend to represent um, other societies or other forms of government outside of uh, communist uh, Russia. And, uh, but they also represent the, the czar who was the former leader of Russia before the Soviet Union. So um, you have you know, characters like Napoleon who represents Stalin, you have Squealer who really represents uh, Pravda, which was the, um, the newspaper of the Soviet Union and other you know, propaganda outlets. And you have animals like Moses who represents the Russian uh, Orthodox Church. Um, so you know, these slides have some interesting uh, connections between the different characters and you know, how they relate to each other. And so the characters, which we will discuss you know, in future classes, include, of course, Napoleon, uh, Benjamin, the donkey, Old Major, who is a pig, uh, Moses. And you can see that you know, they all have their own personalities. They all have their own uh, ways of thinking. They're Squealer, Snowball, Boxer the horse. And he always says, I will work harder. And another thing he says is, Napoleon is always right. And this represents the Russian working class who you know, always worked their hardest to try to, to help Lenin and Stalin, and they believed in the cause. And according to Orwell, the, the Russian working class was betrayed uh, by the communist leadership. The nine dogs represent the, uh, the military or the secret police, you know, the, the, the enforcement arm of communism that is always there to, uh, to enforce rules and uh, regulations. You know, there's Molly who represents the bourgeois or the middle class who, you know, wanted to keep their cash. They wanted to keep their, uh, their wonderful, you know, beautiful uh, dresses and suits and, and houses and, you know, mansions. And they didn't want to give any of that up. So they end up defecting to another country. In this case, another farm. Uh, then we have Clover, who I think represents, you know, the women of Russia, the, the wives and, and the... Uh, and the uh, sisters and, and daughters and everybody who really suffered under uh, Stalin's regime. So we'll talk about those in future classes, but that's a, an introduction to Animal Farm and you know, the concept of dystopia, as well as the concept of allegory, where you know, almost everything in Animal Farm represents a person, a situation, or a place from real life. So thank you for listening, and I will see you in class.